doesn't matter if you're a new hunter, if you've been hunting 50 years, if you're really into it, passionate, you've only been hunting five years, it doesn't really matter what stage you are in the game, you can't ignore the afternoon food source. That is the number way, one way to find deer, but it's not just finding deer. Obviously, if they're feeding here, you'll find them, but it establishes a whole pattern that you can, in, that you can hunt, a whole strategy, a whole system for hunting whitetails anywhere a whitetail roams. This applies to private and public land. So this is Whitetail Habitat Solutions. A lot of our videos, especially the whitetail strategy videos, which are over 50% of all of our videos combined, deal directly with public land hunters and private land hunters. So these strategies apply to anyone. Most of the strategies apply to anybody. Obviously we're talking about a food plot, which we'll get to in a second. That's private land only for the most part. But it doesn't matter how long you've been hunting whitetails, you need to understand this because this is the way that you'll consistently find whitetails anywhere a whitetail roams. You can go into any public land, any private land parcel, and figure whitetails out in that location and a whole an entire stand assemblage too, where morning stands, evening stands, if you understand the afternoon food source. The afternoon food source means daylight food source. We don't care where deer are feeding at two in the morning. 10 o'clock at night, midnight. Obviously, they'll relate to that. We want to know where they're at during the daylight. The person that has the, the deer in front of them, obviously, during the daylight is the person that shoots them. Who cares where they're at at night? Often, a buck's home range is expressed to only 5% during the daylight hours compared to 95% of his home. So if a mature buck has an average square, uh, three square mile home range, he's only gonna move within a few hundred yards during the daylight. He doesn't wanna expose himself if he moves a half mile during the daylight. Unless you're out in Montana and he's moving during the daylight across big open alfalfa fields and big bottoms where there's no hunting pressure, he's going to die. He's gonna get hit by a car. He's going to expose himself every time he crosses another hunting. Think about that. Every time a buck crosses another land border, he's exposing himself to another set of hunters. By the time he does that three or four times during the daylight, say during the rut, he's got a good chance of being shot, especially in those prime time hunting hours. So he does not move very far. So where he feeds at 2 a.m. is probably a mile or more likely from where he feeds public land. Where you find a buck feeding at 2 a.m. on a bunch of bait piles in northern Michigan, UP of Michigan, he's probably betting three quarters of a mile to a mile away. That's cool if you know these baiting, the people are baiting over there and he's feeding there. But you need to go a long ways to find where he's going to be at during the daylight to consistently kill that buck. Afternoon food source is critical. Difference is from private to public land, private land, you build it. You don't build it by cutting down trees, planting apple trees, planting mass production trees, oaks, chestnuts. You build it by planting a food plot. You don't build it by just allowing the whims of the crop rotations around you on farmland to build a great hunt for you on your 80 acre parcel, your 20 acre parcel, even your 500 acre parcel. You have to determine and tell the deer this is what you're going to do every single day during the daylight, every single year, regardless of what goes on around you, that's how you build a deer herd. You do that through the afternoon food source where they hit during the daylight. Because on my property here in Minnesota, my, the property I hunt in Wisconsin, they feed on the food plots and then they go out to the ag fields after dark. That's where they feed all night. Who cares if they're out in those ag fields every night? They don't get there until after dark. That's not how you build a deer herd out there. You build it on the private land parcel that has the afternoon food source and on public land. Cool thing about public land, it's a lot less work. And yes, I just said that. It's a lot less work to hunt public land because you just put in boot time. You don't have to lime food plots. You don't have to fertilize. You don't have to spray. You don't have to plant seed. You don't have to mow. And that's not even talking about bedding areas, water holes, mock scrapes. You just have to find the afternoon food source where they're feeding deer in the daylight because deer feed five times in a 24 hour period. I heard a biologist, national biologist, someone was talking about that, you know, that doesn't matter. They'll, they'll sit in conifer or grass during the day and they don't need to feed in their bedding areas and that's hogwash. Sometimes they're forced to. I know areas in Northern Ohio where they're in switchgrass all day long, even though they have no food in there, native grasses, conifers, autumn olive thicket, whatever it might be, if there's no food in there, they might be there because of a lack of cover in the area. If, if simply, if they leave that to go find food, they die. But if they have a choice, which is what, I, what you're looking at, it doesn't matter if it's on public land, you're finding it, or private land, you're building it, they wanna feed in their bedding areas twice during the daylight hours. They wanna feed on their third feeding of the day, which is their most important right before dark, and then they'll feed twice during the night. On public land, find the afternoon food source, Find adjacent bedding area that's secure, 
that hunters aren't walking right through the middle of, that has some type of regeneration and browse, just some diversity of habitat. Could be where a hill meets a marsh, could be at the edge of a clear cut, could be at the edge of a clear cut, hardwoods and acorns are dropping at that time. The problem is that acorns don't drop the entire season. White oaks drop early, red oaks drop later, and so you have to time your public land hunts with where the food is at at the moment that takes some boot work but a lot less work throughout the entire year other than walking around big big difference now i'll give you an example on private land people say well i can't plant food pots well i wouldn't hunt there i wouldn't buy it i wouldn't lease it because that's the advantage of private land build a food plot build a herd do it right do it smart don't spook the deer off that food plot consider it a sanctuary and you can build a herd very easily by building a season long food source. You don't do that in the off season. Don't, don't pat yourself on the back if you have a whole bunch of food in June, July, August, September, because that's not when you build a deer herd. I would simply hunt public land if that was my choice. I like hunting public land. I hunt public land every year. I hunted public land in the UP of Michigan last year. I usually hunt sometimes Michigan and Pennsylvania, but at least one of those states every year. I've hunted Ohio seven different years. I like hunting public land because I can go find the food of the moment. And that's the difference. You're not finding the season long food source on public land unless you're hunting next to private land bait piles like in Ohio, maybe even the UP of Michigan, someplace like that where you know that someone's going to bait the entire year. And that does happen in Ohio. There's areas like that. Maybe there's a giant golf course or ag field that's next to a giant block of public land and that's all the deer have to feed on at night. Well, then you can capitalize on that because you know where their afternoon food source is, where they're all heading. That puts them in a certain location during the daylight. And a lot of times if it's a nighttime food source where they're feeding in an hour or two hours after dark well then during the daylight just look at a half mile border from there and you can find where they're bedded on public land that's what's so different about the two private you build it public land you go find it i want to mention real quick you can see this if you're lucky enough to win the hunt drawing leo won it last year he's a firefighter from ann arbor michigan and we have a hunt drawing at our charity event coming up on June 11th. It's $100 to get in. You just contact info at whitetailhabitatsolutions.com and you can get in on that drawing. It's $100. It's for a two-day hunt, late September, and we're flexible with that. You know, likely during the middle of the week, maybe on the weekend. It really depends on, on when you're available. But we host you here, feed you, and give you a good hunt. And part of that is that time of the year, we're really not going out in the morning because we don't want to spook the deer off the food source. We're really hitting that afternoon set. Leo had a great opportunity. He calls it a hunt of a lifetime uh, last year. Dylan was in the blind with him. Dante was in the blind filming with him too. So we'll film you. We'll have some fun, kick back, have some food and beverage, and uh, shoot the bows, hang out. And you get to know a lot about the land. But what you'll see is how we really meticulously try to keep from spooking deer on that afternoon food source. Because once you do that, that location is ruined. It doesn't matter if it's private or public land, you can do it on both. And it's very easy to do it on private land because deer typically have a choice to find somewhere else where there's food, decent cover, and it's not being disturbed. So you can check that out at the hunt drawing. Again, email us at info at whitetailhabitatsolutions.com. You can find that, just put the con click on the contact us button at whitetailhabitatsolutions.com, the website. And you can find that's hundred dollars it's limited to just a hundred people we have a lot of people buying two to three to four tickets and so i think leo uh, bought three tickets or had one bought for him or something i forget the story but he had about a one in 30 chance last year so um he made good on it and uh and i you know if you guys win that can't wait to meet you number three here once you have that afternoon food source you're not spooking it and again i want to show you that if you if you end up coming out here we film that and everything but once you have that then you know where the buck's bed so if they're hitting here during the daylight or around daylight on this food source it's a quality food source it's lasting at that moment then they're going to be going to be within a half mile and typically in most parcels big open public land maybe a half mile and on private land they'll usually be within two to four hundred yards of that location so once you find that pretty easy to look at the most diversity in the area that's not being spooked not near a road in pretty remote location where people aren't disturbing and that's where that buck will be you can typically look at a property with food plots or an ag field around it and say okay if you're having a mature buck hitting that food source during daylight, he has to bed here because he's not going to bed in that mature timber. He doesn't want to bed in that solid stand of conifer over here. He's bedding around the swamp edge back in here because that's the most undisturbed location. And it's within that range because he does not want to travel again across several borders 
to get to that food source, let alone go a half mile in most private land areas. The longer they travel in the afternoon to get to that food source, the more they expose themselves. That'll establish buck bedding. Doe bedding's in between. Doe's bed a lot closer to the food and bucks. Um, usually several times closer, 50, 100 yards instead of 400 yards, 300 yards. So a lot closer to that food source. They're straight line movers. They go from bedding to food, food to bedding, back and forth. And they have a, a fraction of the home range even at night as a mature buck. What that means is that mature buck will find that food source. If you find a great food source, whatever it is, in December on public land, maybe even a nice clear cut, a fresh clear cut where there's a lot of early successional growth, then you'll find those mature bucks because they're willing to travel a long ways and they already travel a long ways. It's likely within their wheelhouse of movement at some point. So they find it, they go there in December. That's why a lot of bucks disappear. People think, well, they were shot during gun season in November when really they're just on a food source a mile and a half away, a remote food source. And it's crazy what you would shoot, someone else might be passing up and you think, well, no one had ever passed that buck up. And then all of a sudden he shows up again and it was just someone wanted to give him another year and they could do that because they have the afternoon food source. That establishes morning and evening stands. You hunt evening closer to the food source without spooking it. And then during the daylight, you say, okay, if that buck's bedding there on that swamp edge, I'm gonna go around and well away from that food source in the morning because he might be there. I'm gonna get next to that swamp and blow my scent across this swamp right here where it's wet and he can't travel or into this open hardwoods or into the neighboring house, whatever it might be, and wait for him to come back to me. And that's how it's fairly easy to shoot bucks when you have a defined afternoon food source because that tells you where to hunt in the morning. It tells you where to hunt in the evening. And given the fact that mature bucks move and travel and cruise about three times more during the morning hour daylights than the afternoon, it's likely you shoot them in this bedding area. And that's about the ratio of bucks I shoot. I shoot some in the evening over food or near food or going to food, but at least two thirds of all my bucks have been shot in the morning, my oldest bucks, mature bucks because it's fairly easy with longer movement times to capitalize on that morning hunt than hunting in the afternoon where they can come into that food from a lot of different angles depending on that wind. You know, they might start in the same spot, they're bedding right here, and their food's over here, they end up here, and depending on the wind, they might travel this way to that food, they might travel this way, I call it a football movement. something like that. Does, if that's their food source, they're bedded right here, they go to here. That's the movement they have. They go straight in. And then after dark, both of them, like that, does fit in this range, bucks are out here. They have a lot larger nighttime home range than does. So does after that afternoon food source might be in this window, bucks can be a mile and a half away from there at night. And so that's where they'll find that food source. That's where a lot of bucks disappear too. But that establishes hard morning and evening stands. So even on public land, you can say, well, I'm gonna hunt here in the morning. I'm gonna hunt here in the evening. Rarely do you have this perfect spot in between where a buck will cruise and he has a chance to be in there mid-morning, mid-afternoon. Because if you're hunting in his bedding area or around, let's say my stand is right here with my scent blowing to the outside. The closer it gets to dark, he's moving away from my position. That's why in the evening, if I'm hunting here in the morning, I'm gonna do anything I can to get around and hunt here. And then I get the best of both worlds. That's called call, it, call it scoring the day. I'm looking for a 10 out of 10 set in the evening and a 10 out of 10 set in the morning by bedding area. That's why if you're a 10 out of 10 stand location, this is perfect, perfect winds. You think a buck's in there in the morning, the closer it gets to dark, it, it drops to a three, to a two, to a one out of 10 because those bucks are moving away from your position and you should be by food. It gives you that set stand assemblage where you can say on public or private land, I need to hunt here in the morning, here in the evening. If you don't know the difference between morning and bedding, or, you, or morning bedding area hunting and evening food source hunting, and everything seems blurred or grayed, you're thinking, man, I have bucks that are moving out here in a random location in the evening. It's probably because that food source has been destroyed or there's no food source to begin with, so the movement is random. Food takes random movement and makes it highly defined, doesn't matter if it's public or private land. What's your most important sanctuary that you can find on public or private land? Public land, they're hitting a great stand of white oaks and they're removing, they're going through a lot of remote cover, thick brush to get to that location. It's five acres, it's on a southwest facing bench in Ohio. I'm thinking of a spot just like this. If no one spooks out that white oak, 
then if hunters are around and happen to spook out that buck out of a bedding area, he'll just move to a different bedding area, but he'll go to that white oak stand. On the flip side, if you spook out that white oak stand, he's somewhere else. He's a mile away, two miles away. Because again, he wants to live within that two to 400, 500 yard, half mile on big public land, adjacent to that evening food source. So if you spook out the evening food source, you don't have them in those bedding areas during the daylight. That's why the most important piece of a sanctuary, a true sanctuary on the land you hunt, public or private land, is the afternoon food source. The afternoon food source sets the table for your entire hunt, public or private land. No matter what experience level you are, you find the afternoon food source on public land, you build it on private land, and you could hunt and have the best hunt in the area that is a highly defined hunt for both morning and evening stands that gives you a range of stands to hunt, protect that food source at all costs. And that is why that afternoon food source by far is the number one ingredient for you in giving yourself the highest potential whitetail hunt anywhere a whitetail roams because they're feeding five times a day. That stomach rules their hunt, it rules where they bed. But not only that, it rules exactly and highly defines where you can kill that buck of a lifetime this fall. Now I'm excited again this year to host our Camp Kicking Bear charity event. Last year we did it in June and it was a big success. We were able to raise over 21,000 for Camp Kicking Bear. There's some people that actually made comments that they get sick of hearing about this kind of stuff and whatever else. I think they didn't understand that we're actually raising money. This Camp Kicking Bear is to me the number one children's organization that gets kids in the outdoors, their families, especially a lot of kids that don't have the opportunity to do so otherwise. June 11th, we'll, I'll have more details coming out about this, but you can email us for early registration. June 11th, it'd be midday, you know, like 11 to four type thing, 10 to five, 10 to four. What I do is there's 50 people that register for this. We give that all to Camp Kicking Bear. Well, it's a habitat day. We go out for a couple hours on the property and I show you some strategies that you can take home to your own land. Number three, we have a hunt raffle for 100 people. The, the registration for 50 people is $300. That gets you in the door to actually see the property and the land. $100 gets you in a hunt raffle times 100 people. We had uh, Leo from Lower Michigan. Had a uh, hunt last year, many memories, uh, end of uh, September for a couple days. Number four, Lots of door prizes, Matthews bows, blinds. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that uh, we give away. Really good stuff for you, too. Kids are free. I think we had about 25, 30 kids last year. All proceeds, again, go to Kicking Bear. Every dollar, every dime we raise goes to Kicking Bear. We'll have some other auction. Last year, Chris B. came. We might have Kevin Smith, retired Major League Baseball player. I hear that Gary Suter, he's a NHL Hall of Famer. He might show up, too. So... There's some chance to meet there. And then, of course, Ray Howell. He was here last year. He delivered his testimony. It was an awesome, inspirational talk that he gave to everyone. Hope to see you there. Look for further details on the site and then the description for the video.